Think Forward. Think Research Channel. It is one of the most popular sports in North America, landing the big one from a stream or lake and sometimes talking about the one that got away. But it is also a sport that only hints at what lies beneath the surface of those waters. Those species we are familiar with as game fish make up barely 10% of all freshwater species on the continent. Those other fish, those non-game fish, are remarkably diverse and remarkably threatened. There are many species of game fish in North America, the various types of trout sought by the serious fly fisher, the sunfish, including the largemouth and smallmouth bass and smaller species commonly referred to as panfish, and there are others, gar for example, and catfish. In fact, there is a fuzzy line between game and non-game species. Our definition of game fish is somewhat biased by perspective. Uh, Non-game fishes are actually used for, uh, for food and, and by tradition in some places in the southern Appalachians. But generally for the professionals, the game fish are those that are regulated by state agencies as to how many you can fish for and how many you can take. The non-game for, for the general public are usually those that are considered as uh, food for the game fishes or bait fishes, etc. But as a fish's value is relative and cannot be based entirely on its use as a sport or food fish, all fish have a role to play in the underwater world. While many, of course, serve as dinner for game fish, which serve as dinner for people, Mel Warren can tell you that others provide different benefits to people. One of the most common minnows in the upper Appalachians is a minnow called the stone roller. And research has shown that that stone roller keeps the bottom of the streams clean, swept clean because of their, their mode of, of living there. That's an attribute that nobody pays for. It doesn't cost us any money. There's no taxes on it. But this minnow is cleaning up our stream bottoms absolutely for nothing. Stone rollers scrape algae off rocks to keep the stream swept clean, but many scientists will argue that non-game fish are valuable not because they perform a task, but just because they exist, because they are part of the world in which we live. These are wonderful animals. They've got great personalities. Uh, they, they have wonderful behaviors. They're complicated, and they're, they're part of these really diverse aquatic ecosystems of southeastern United States. For others, the value of these non-game fish is measured in dollars and cents. The objective of the farm is to make money. Uh, we raise freshwater tropical fish. Jim Guild operates the Apwell Fish Farm near Tampa, Florida. For him, non-game fish are more than a passing interest. They're a crop of sorts. At the three different farm operations total, uh, Eckwell employs approximately 90 people. Apwell raises about 150 different varieties of non-game fish, selling them as a product to professional aquaria and aquarium supply stores across the country. This is no small enterprise. We have about 800 ponds on all our farms combined. Ponds range in size from as big as a half acre in our farm in Arcadia to 20th acre ponds that we use for different purposes. Besides aquarium fish, commercial operations raise non-game fish for bait shops or to feed food fish being raised by other commercial growers. It is called aquaculture and it is growing in this country at a rapid pace. Non-game fish are valuable for reasons that cannot be measured in dollars, of course. A change in their population in a stream or lake can indicate pollution problems we cannot see like the canaries in the coal mine that would die when poisonous gases threaten the miners, these fish can warn us that the water they live in is becoming polluted. But isn't being a part of the world we live in value enough? Phil Peaster will tell you that it is. I've had that question asked many times, both by media people, newspaper reporters, public generally. What good are they? 
Well, it's a good question. I think we owe it to the public to answer that question as well as we can. The more other species we lose, the more human beings become endangered because they're losing the support organisms biologically that ultimately, through habitat quality and other things, clean water, clean air, keep human beings alive. So this, I think, is an important concept there. That the same things that cause species to go extinct ultimately cause us to go extinct. So it's not just the loss of one or two species of fish, it's the loss of clean water and the loss of whole ecosystems that keep the earth in balance. Perhaps the enormous value of fish is understood no better than at the Tennessee Aquarium in Chattanooga, understood not just by the scientists and curators, but by the public. Well, the public response to the aquarium has absolutely been fantastic. Since opening in May 92, uh, in less than two years, over two and a half million people have come through our doors and it's really been an economic boost to the city of Chattanooga and to the region. The aquarium emphasizes the diversity of aquatic species throughout the southeastern United States from Roaring Mountain Stream to Delta. People see redfish, green fish, blue fish, yellow fish. People see small fish, they see large fish. You can see a 70 pound flathead catfish. You could see a darter that's two inches long that's just colored like the rainbow. And the diversity, again, especially the regional diversity, is just astounding. And, and again, we try and provide it as much of that diversity as we can within the aquarium. And there is a lot to provide. 90% of North America's fish are non-game species. The family of minnows, for example, is the largest and most diverse family, comprising 231 species. And as typical bait for larger game fish, the family portrays an ecological role non-game fish play in the freshwater environment. Members of the minnow family are generally small schooling fish, including shiners, minnows, dace, and chubs. While considered non-game fish, they do have an economic value as bait fish and are raised commercially for that purpose. But there are larger minnows as well, carp, that illustrate the fuzzy distinction between game and non-game fish. Sometimes called a nuisance in America, carp are prized as food and game in Europe and Asia and are raised commercially for that purpose. After minnows, perch and darters make up the next most diverse fish family with 153 species. While a few are sought by anglers, the vast majority of species in the group are small one to six inch fish called darters. They live primarily on the bottoms of streams and rivers, and though small, they are spectacular in color and behavior, particularly during breeding season. There are other families, of course, such as sculpins, small bottom-dwelling fish that serve as an important link in the food chain, eating insects and smaller fish, and themselves being eaten by game fish and other wildlife. Another family that serves as dinner for many game fish is the sucker, 63 species populate North America, preferring clean, unpolluted water and deep pools of streams and shallow areas of lakes. As the name implies, they vacuum the bottom of the lake or stream for insects and worms. While many of us are familiar with the larger members of the catfish family, there are other smaller varieties called mad toms that are not fished for sport or for food. All catfish species are bottom dwellers with flattened bodies, barbels or whiskers, and mildly poisonous spines. Other families in North America's fresh waters include groups that evolved millions of years ago and have remained basically unchanged since that time. A lot of people don't realize that the fish fauna in North America has what we call ancient elements. These are fishes that are in fact older than the dinosaurs and examples of these are like lampreys, paddlefishes, sturgeons, gars. Some of these fishes were swimming in our rivers at the time when the dinosaurs were walking the earth 125 million years ago. Unlike many non-game fish, these species that swam with the dinosaurs are usually big, up to eight feet long in the case of the paddlefish. But even with all these families, the darters and minnows dominate the continent's fish populations in numbers and diversity. Between the two, they probably constitute very close to three-fourths of our southeastern freshwater fishes. And just because of their very size, they're rich in endangered species. They've got a lot of personality. They've got a lot of color. Both of these groups essentially have their 
centers of diversity in the southeastern Appalachians, uh, in particular the darters with 120 species or so, all confined to eastern and central North America and just about all of them in the southeast. Indeed, the southeast Appalachian region is by far the most diverse spot on the continent when it comes to fish, says Ed Nyer, because glaciers never wiped out river systems there the way they wiped out systems over much of the rest of the continent. And while time has been on their side, the fishes there have found other catalysts to help them diversify. And that's mainly because we have so many different kinds of natural places here. And what I mean by that is that we have mountains with rushing streams and white water. We have coastal plains with slow moving waters and bayous. We have clear waters and we have mucky waters. We have sandy bottom streams and gravelly bottom streams. And so we go from 6,000 or so feet right down to the coast and with all kinds of soils and all kinds of rocks. And this gives us all kinds of streams and all kinds of natural waters. Virtually any natural body of fresh water is habitat for at least one species of fish. Springs often feed small mountain streams, which in turn converge to form larger rivers or lakes. But a single body of water can offer several habitats for fish. Bill Ensign is a Virginia Tech researcher assessing the habitats of the upper Roanoke River in western Virginia. You have riffles and pools. That's the two basic habitat types in most streams like the Roanoke. Riffles, people think of fast running water, smaller substrates. Uh, pool areas are deeper, slow moving water. And you do see fish segregating among these two habitat types. For most people, the ones they're real familiar with are the pool species like the basses and the sunfish because that's what we fish for and that's where they like to hang out. Many of the minnows are also found in pool habitats. Many of the darters and the suckers are more common in the riffles and the runs, the faster moving areas. It's not just riffles and pools, temperature, oxygen content, the stuff on the bottom and the availability of cover all figure into whether a species can find a home in a certain body of water. On a tiny mountain stream in the central Appalachians, a crew of Virginia Tech and U.S. Forest Service workers is doing some very selective timbering. They're pushing trees into the stream to provide a very particular kind of habitat for fish known as large woody debris. It's actually a reversal of the way things used to be when the trend was to clean up streams of such material to, in theory, make them better. Well, you can see in some areas where they've removed debris in the past, the stream becomes almost channelized. There's no habitat there. Just swift flowing water and trout cannot, they don't like that sort of habitat. Um, so it, the stream needs structure, actually, and that's what the large woody debris pr provides. Brook trout are the, are the focus because that's what attracts the most attention. However, if we were able to focus on the stream bottom here, we'd see a very healthy population of fantail darters, uh, other native species like black-nosed dace, and certainly uh, crayfish. As we learn where all these fish species live, we are also learning how they live. Most have life cycles we know little or nothing about. We do know they develop in stages, from egg, to fry, to juvenile, sometimes called fingerling, to adult. Many live a short life, three years or less, although some, such as the sturgeon, can live as long as 100 years. While most game fish eat smaller fish, many of these non-game species form the intermediate links in the food chain. Some eat other fish, but most eat insects or algae. Every aspect of a fish's life cycle contributes to its success, or as we shall see, to its demise. And too often these days, many non-game fish species are facing threats to their very existence. Pollution is a problem, of course, while oil spills and raw sewage can cause sudden and extensive death in our rivers and lakes, often the pollution is more subtle surface runoff from our farms, our streets, or even our lawns can pose a chemical threat to fish. And surface runoff also means silt. When the bottom is degraded by sedimentation, it destroys their prey, it, it ruins the places that they can typically hide, and it often destroys the reproductive success by killing or smothering eggs. And that silt can come from any number of sources. Much of the time, someone above the surface of the water just isn't thinking about damage being done below the surface. Bad timbering practices unleash a torrent of sediment into nearby creeks. 
Free-roaming livestock on farms stir up the stream bottoms while adding their own manure to the mix. Construction lays bare the soil around the site and the slightest rain can add more sediment to nearby waters. All of these methods of silting our natural waters can be traced back to one obvious source, people, more and more people. Well, what we're seeing in the southeast is a tremendous growth in the human population. A lot of people moving in from other regions of the country. And the development that you get from that impacts habitat. And you wind up with a very fragmented distribution pattern for a lot of the, the aquatics. Perhaps nowhere is that cutting off of fish populations better demonstrated than in the construction of dams. Literally thousands of dams have been built on our rivers, many in the mid-20th century when well-meaning government agencies and private businesses turned free-flowing streams into lakes. There's only one natural lake system in the entire southern Appalachian area, and that's Mountain Lake in southwestern Virginia. There are no other lake systems in this system, so it's a flowing water fauna. These animals have adapted to spawning, to feeding, and to sheltering in flowing water conditions. So when we dam major rivers and sometimes small rivers and sometimes even small tributaries, we change dramatically the situations in which these fishes evolve and go about the daily business of living. If we had fishes that lived in a river that was 100, 200, 300 miles long, those fishes could, during their lifetime perhaps, or during the lifetime of several generations, move or swim from one part of the river to another. Now with barriers such as dams, uninhabitable polluted areas, all the populations exist in little pieces. Dams disrupt the way things were, the habitat in which a fish species evolved. But it doesn't necessarily take a force as large as a dam to bring a species to the brink of extinction. They are called exotics, species such as zebra mussels. They show up where they shouldn't be because of human activity hitching a ride in boat ballast water, or dumped by a kid tired of his or her aquarium. Commercial fish farms raise exotic species, and sometimes by flood or hurricane, or other accidental means, they escape. There are literally scores of exotics that have been introduced into the fresh waters of the United States. All have some impact. Some, such as the zebra mussel, are devastating, filtering out much of the food or covering up all of the substrate that other aquatics need to live. The fear is that as these dominating exotic species spread, they'll wipe out smaller native populations and the ecosystems in which they live. By tracking the spread of these exotic species, the Florida Caribbean Science Center of the U.S. Geological Survey in Gainesville, Florida, hopes to pinpoint where the battlefronts will be, where efforts to save native species are most promising, and there are a lot of efforts underway. At the lab, Ken Sulak is leading a fight to save one of the country's oldest and oddest native fish, the Gulf sturgeon. The history of the species is that they began commercial fishery in the late 1800s and have fished the species to the brink of extinction so that in the 1980s it was listed as a threatened species. And since then we've been trying to study the species to take effective measures for conservation and restoration. These fish can reach 8 feet in length and weigh 200 pounds, but Sulak says they are still vulnerable to human activity, especially dams. The lab is trying to determine where native Gulf sturgeon populations are strongest and whether they're strong enough to survive on their own or whether they'll need protection. Similar techniques are being used to help save a species similar in size and age, and even more striking in appearance, the paddlefish. Also, victims of dams and other human-made barriers, paddlefish are being trapped so their eggs and sperm can be artificially removed and mixed and hatched to enhance the species' chances at survival. Nice day for a swim, except that the water's about 55 degrees. These Virginia Tech Fisheries graduate students are taking the plunge to help preserve a very different species, the candy darter a small, colorful fish which is known to exist in only three places in the world. Loss of the candy darter could affect other aquatic species, indeed the whole ecosystem, so Diana Dalton gladly braves the chilly waters. The candy darter is a species of concern here in Virginia and looking at how to help the fish 
if, if it were to get in trouble that we could move individuals into the lab to spawn them there and then to return them back to the streams. The students are also investigating whether candy darters can be reintroduced to other river systems where they used to be because the ones they're still in are under siege. A lot of streams have been changed, uh, the valleys have been settled, turned into farms, uh, plants have been built, subdivisions. It's just all the human perturbations in the watershed increases the silt load and, and other organics and, and chemical constituents. So Dalton and Bai will continue their chilly swims in a handful of Appalachian streams, hoping the candy darter will continue to swim along with them. A little further south in the foothills of the Great Smokies in Tennessee, another group is working to save other small fish. As you can see, I'm wet just coming out of the water uh, doing some work here in Abrams Creek. Uh, we've been surveying for some of our reintroductions of uh, smoky and yellowfin mad toms and dusky tail darters. At Conservation Fisheries Incorporated, the idea is to breed fish collected from a relatively healthy population and relocate them to places where they used to be. Human intervention to undo the damage that human intervention did in the first place. For several years now, they've been collecting adult spot fin chubs from the Little Tennessee River and then transporting them and, and basically translocating them here into the creek. Uh, the last year we reared uh, from aquarium reproduction, about 2,000 individuals, which we have stocked this year. And that only required nine adults <laughs> to produce a couple thousand young, so you can see the advantages there of doing it that way. In its work, Conservation Fisheries is assembling an inventory of where threatened and endangered fish are in the southeast, so they won't be threatened in the future. My job is to keep track of where the rare animals, aquatic animals, still live. Uh, or might live so that um, when people apply for permits from TVA or people that TVA cooperate with uh, that we can make appropriate comments so that if, if they are still there considerations are taken with whatever projects that are happening. This kind of helping hand to non-game fish is a relatively new process funded for the most part through U.S. Fish and Wildlife grants, state non-game programs, and through the Endangered Species Act. The act works to strike a balance between the natural world and the manufactured world. The intent of the Endangered Species Act is not to stop projects. The intent of the Endangered Species Act is to protect the species and work with the local communities so that those projects can go forward so that economic development can continue. But in the same vein, all we're trying to continue the economic development is work to try to preserve the fish at the same time. While Congress from time to time debates whether the Endangered Species Act should be cut back or even eliminated, Patrick Rakes is hoping the concern that brought the act to life in the first place will spur a new related activity. There's been talk of perhaps converting hatcheries from game fish production to propagation of rare and endangered species. I would certainly like to see, uh, by the time I'm old and gray, a lot of success stories. <laughs> a lot of successful reintroductions, and a lot of healthy streams with their natural uh, fish communities returned to them. But that will take more support from the public, and that means educating the public on what non-game fish are all about. And that is what Bill Roston is all about. Probably about 12 years ago, I started photographing fish in their natural environment. I've made up my mind to not only do it with the still camera, but more recently uh, with the video. Whenever I get a chance and get away, I'm out traveling the country. I'd jumping in the water and trying to see what's there. The Missouri native works to record as many fish as he can, doing as many different things as they can, to show people what goes on beneath the surface of our freshwater rivers and lakes. And after a dozen years, he is worried that what he is documenting may be lost forever. We have to make people aware of what's there. And we can start, number one, by not throwing things into the river and doing everything that we can to prevent pollution of the river. Uh, there's a lot of, of factors, uh, agriculture, acid rain, you, you name it. There's a lot of factors that are affecting the pollution of our streams and the quality of our water. What it all comes down to is education. More and more scientists are looking to educate the public that there are other species besides the stars of nature, the eagles and bears and such, that deserve as much attention and protection. And in classrooms such as this one in Christiansburg, Virginia, teachers are introducing our children to the underwater world of non-game fish. 
We've done everything from taking fish and plotting the volume of the room and seeing how many fish would fit in our room if it were an aquarium, and then building fish to scale within the room. We've done stream improvement where we've looked at, at fish in different streams and looking at the velocity of the stream. And public aquaria, large and small, are finding new audiences to entertain and educate. The aquarium is more than just an attraction. We are focused on education, particularly about the environments and the ecosystems around freshwater systems, first around the Tennessee River, but really around the world. We bring children in here with program work every morning uh, during the school year, but we also try to educate adults about the, the importance of freshwater in, on our earth. We knew that we could be a success economically, but, but our true success will be measured in future generations when these children teach their children to take better care of the earth. Private individuals are getting involved as well as they come to understand that what they do can affect life in our rivers and lakes. One of the problems with streams is erosion and siltation. Because of poor land use practices, cutting of vegetation, cutting of trees along stream banks, we're able to go in and help the landowners that are willing to participate with us to replant the trees, to fence cattle out of these streams so that they're, they're not trampling down the stream banks. And through that way, we help to recover the stream so that the species that exist there now are able to do better and then to recover the streams to the point where we can reintroduce some of the species that used to be there. Attitudes are changing as more and more people get involved in what's going on beneath the surface of America's waters. The public has to become involved and watch for events of dirty water. Look and find out where that dirty water is coming from. Be careful with the use of pesticides and herbicides. If you're changing your oil in your car, be careful of what you do with that waste oil. Become interested in and an advocate for stream protection, stream cleanups. Get out, organize groups to go out and, and clean up trash from along the streams and create a respect for this valuable resource.